Trey Gunn here. Uh, what you've been working on uh, these days? I've seen uh, you got your uh, new modulator album. Incredible work on that. Well, thank you. It, that was a, a a very, very, very involved and challenging project. I've been working on it for two years. I, I thought it would only be about six months, um, but the 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 complication of the or the challenge of the record was that I wrote the entire record to a 50-minute drum solo. So the um, the drums came first, and all the music went on top of the drums, and there was no editing allowed of the drums. So I had to just take the drums as they were from this crazy 50-minute drum solo of Marco Minimums. And what I ended up writing was, I think, I think 22 tracks, 22 different compositions on top of it. So that's... Uh, that, that fatigued me. <laughs> I've been taking a break since that. <laughs> so there, there's not much albums like that out there, huh? Is there? It's never been done before like this. Um, and, and actually, I'm not the, except for the fact that I'm not the only one who did this. Six different, or six or seven different musicians wrote their own records to the same drum solo. Um, Mike Keneally, guitar player in L.A., Alex Makachek, guitar player from Vienna, several different people. Um, and Alex had done some of this, something like this before. He took a drum solo of Terry Bozio's and wrote music to it. And, and Alex kind of helped initiate this with, he, he asked Marco, you know, do you have anything that I could write to? And Marco said, well, I have this 51 minute drum solo. And Alex took it and started working on it. And then that kind of Marco went around and tried to find other guys to do it. And actually I said no to Marco for a year him asking me would I do it and I said no no I don't want to do this this is too much this is too crazy I don't even like drum solos hmm. two minutes of drum soloing is plenty for me so to be presented with 51 minutes of it and then try to make um, a full record with all the the shape and journey and different variations and sounds and textures that I like from records it was it was a challenge I'm really happy with it I mean I I, I I, I wrote a lot of music that I never would ever be able to write, being being forced to phrase it and shape it to what Marco had laid down with the drums was a I'm 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 really happy with how that that, that thing of being constrained as a as a creator really did open up new doors for me. So it was an incredible experience. What type of methods did you go into doing this like um you know, plug in your uh, bass and guitars and all that stuff onto the recording unit and just go from there? What I, what, I, what I figured out was that having one musical idea wasn't enough to go with Marco. If I could find one idea that worked and develop it, that didn't work. What I needed was two different ideas, either two different kinds of musical gestures or two different kinds of totally different sounds or something. So I kind of made a triad between his drumming and then these two musical ideas. So what I would do in order to find them is I would just run the drums and either have an idea and, and I would just start throwing something up there. Basically, I called it like throwing mud on the wall and you mm -hmm. just keep throwing stuff until something sticks. And then if it's a bass part, if it's a guitar part, if it's a violin part, if it's a, if it's a keyboard part, whatever, I just keep putting stuff on there until something sticks. And once one thing sticks, I kind of shape that into a musical idea. And then I needed to start throwing completely other kinds of musical ideas up against it until I had two different things that stuck. And, and I'm just talking about in a particular section of the, the record, let's say 23 minutes, from 23 minutes to 27 minutes into the drum solo. So now I've got two ideas that, that work in this area, and now I shape them. Do I, do I have them going simultaneously? Do I have one of them defining a section that goes into another section? Do I solo, what, what not? That was, that was basically the strategy, that if I didn't have two ideas, I had, to, I had to throw out whatever I had and start over again, and many times I started over again. That was one of the processes. Uh, another process that I discovered, which is very common for writers, but musicians do not do it, which is rewriting. So basically I would have a section that I'd work on and I'd find some gestures, I'd find some musical ideas that worked there, but it wasn't quite gelling. Because I, what I wanted it to sound like is I wanted it to sound like Marco was following the music, not like everything was piled on top of the drums. Mm. So it needed to sound like the drums were organically, those are the only drums that could play to this music. So I would have 
a basic musical idea that worked, but it wasn't quite working. And what I would do is I would erase it all and just rewrite the whole section again, but knowing what the musical ideas were. So I kind of went through this rewriting process that our, our authors go through, um, but musicians generally don't. Generally, we write a piece of music and either it's good or bad, and if it's good, we keep it, and if it's bad, we throw it out and write something new. And this was kind of like, there's something good in here, but let me try again. I'll do different instruments, or I'll change the idea around, but I'll, but I'll keep the core idea. So that was, that was another one of the strategies. I came up with a lot of them, let me tell you. I'm sure. And what are you currently working on right now? Uh, I've currently been working on a... a, a like I say, I took a break from writing after about for about six months after this record because I I just I just tapped myself out, and I've been putting together a retrospective CD, um, which is a two CD set that that includes uh, selections from all of my different solo works, but also I've gone out and found session work that I've done for other musicians mm-hmm. all over the world. I play. I play on lots of different people's records, but generally most people don't hear that stuff because it's um, it's a record in Mexico and people in Europe don't hear that, or a record in Finland, or records in Russia that have ne- never made it out to the West. So I kind of went to all these different musicians that I had worked with and contributed a track where I played on their record, and I pulled them back in and put them, mixed them in with my material and made this... this uh, double CD set, which is called I T- I'll Tell What I Saw. It's not out in Europe yet, but it's coming out. And uh, so that was a nice way to kind of take a break from hardcore writing, but just survey my work and, and, and look at where I'm going now. That, and then the other thing that I'm doing a lot these days, I started maybe two years ago, but I'm doing a lot, which is coaching other musicians uh, in their own creative process. And so I kind of consult with musicians around the world. We meet on Skype, mm-hmm. and I help them um, just work through their creative process, finding their own vocabulary and how to develop their language and, and how to find uh, music avenues for the music that they want to do. And I'm doing a lot of that. I'm actually going to Sweden in March to, to present a, part of a workshop for a week there for, for musicians on on this process, which is fascinating to me. I learned so much hearing where other musicians are and where they get stuck in their process and where they're successful and noticing the patterns that we all, uh, that we find and, and, and find different strategies and solutions to that. And, and uh, I love it. I love it. And I, I, I suspect it will be a big part of my work over the next decade. And like that, it's a big learning experience for everybody in that sense. It is. It's very much, you know, it's, I, I, I actually started practicing Aikido, which is a Japanese martial art here in Seattle where I live. Uh, I started practicing here about three years ago, and it's very similar to working, my experience working with Aikido, where we're kind of, there, there's people who have more experience than others and people who know more things than others, but we're all just kind of working together and everybody's learning together. So I have, I have different musicians around the world who, who, I coach and we consult together. There's, there's drum. There's a drummer in Michigan. I have some painters because mm-hmm. the process is very much the same. I have harmonica players. I have some writers. I have some touch guitarists in, in Norway. Some guys in South America. And and even though they're not directly in touch with each other, we all are kind of in touch with each other through through me at this point. And um, it's fascinating watching everybody grow together. And it's pretty much it's information and. And, and finding strength work because it, it's, it is a very daunting task to discover your own musical voice and develop it because no one can help you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all, all people can do, all a teacher can do, and why I don't think of myself as a teacher, all a teacher can do is say your, your, your voice, you know, uh, uh, what a teacher has is their own voice. And, and, and that's, that's only useful if you want to mimic your teacher's voice, but if you want to find your own voice, there's no book you can look at. There's no one you can go to and say, well, what should I do? What should I play? What should my music sound like? Well, no one can help you there. So it's really like going into this forest that's just completely covered in moss, and you don't know what's what. So it's kind of nice to have a helper. (laughs) So that's kind of where I am. Yeah. 
and in the world of King Crimson, what's um, what's in store for that in the future? Well, that's something that no one knows. <laughs> no one knows except for Robert Fripp, and who knows if he knows. Um, it seems very unlikely, from my perspective, that Crimson will be performing again. Um, mostly because Robert seems to be not wanting to be on tour ever again. He could change his mind, or he could be, you know, I, I, we have no idea. We have no idea. I have no idea. And that means possibly no album. I would doubt it. I mean, yeah. I, I, it, it seems more... L- what seems the most likely is that Robert would organize a small series of shows somewhere and then record those live shows. But the, the, the process of writing music for Crimson is, at least in, in my involvement, in my 10-year period, um, is very challenging and it's very tricky. So, because it, it, it takes a lot of time, there's a lot of R&D to figure out what the musical language is gonna be because it changes changes from the 1980s, 1973, to, to the late 90s, to the, you know, the 2000 when we did the, the Power to Believe. Sure, it's all crimson, but the, the actual building blocks of the music has to be kind of built from scratch. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Robert has to, Robert has to say he's, he's uh, you know, he's got something there and, and get everyone together and, and, or get together who he wants to, to work on it uh, for that. So I, I have no idea. It's not so simple as just getting together and, and making a record or, or, or doing shows, even though there's a lot of material now, mm-hmm. a lot of old material. But but Crimson just doing old material is not, it's not Crimson, I, I, from my perspective. Crimson is about making something new that, that, that hasn't happened before. So that's in Robert's hands. He'll... Uh, he'll he'll be the one to ask although you won't be able to ask him <laughs> hmm. going on your 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 discography of yourself how how much albums did you appear on would you say in your whole career you know because it's it, it, I, you, you kind of have to divide it up because we um because we've released so many crimson records and so many live records there's actually about 70 75 King Crimson records that I've been on, if you include all the live records that we released. Um, and then outside of that, I mean, I have eight or ten, eight or nine solo records, and then probably 50 or 100 sessions, mm-hmm. session records. So, I don't know. That adds, you know, that adds up to maybe a couple of hundred. Is there somewhere that you have this documented that you do you can go and look at what you uh, accomplished. You know, I do my best on the website, but I don't. I doubt that everything's there. I mean, actually, even when I was working on this retrospective, I had forgotten so many sessions that I had done that I had to go back through my notes and go back through the pile of CDs I have in my closet to remember. Oh, wow! I played on this guy's record in Italy. I I, I forgot about that, so I can't remember. But I I, I do my best, but probably it's not. Uh, Actually, probably nobody has a full list. Tony Levin has a pretty good list on his website, but I bet it's not. I mean, because he's on so many sessions, but I bet it's not complete. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It would be a project, uh, you know, that would last a long time to find all that. Yeah, it would take a lot of work. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to do some of it, but I'd rather be playing music than than some of that. <laughs> Creating the new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's where exciting. I mean, it is nice to have an overview of where you've been. It kind of helps you find where you're going next, which is really what the retrospective is for me. Um, just kind of looking at all the material. And there's no King Crimson material on that on that retrospective. It's just my work. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, Trey, we're looking forward to your uh, latest CD that you're going to be working. Your retrospect that will be interesting to look at too. Yep, you will get it because um, uh, Voice Print Gonzo is going to put it out in a couple of months, and I'm sure you're on the list. Well, looking forward to seeing what uh, you have in this one. Yes, great. Well, Trey, uh, thank you very much for this great interview. And uh... okay, fantastic.